Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in Training, Tanisha Shade Spain. We've got some great questions, topics, and show and tells to get to tonight, so let's just jump right in, shall we? We're going to get started by introducing our wonderful panelists for the evening, and we'll start down here with you if you wouldn't mind yeah. introducing yourself, Bob. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bob Skirvin, and I was a professor here on campus, and I taught introduction to horticulture for 40 years. I'm retired now. My, my specialty is grapes and wine and blackberries and raspberries and small fruits. Wonderful. So okay, great. Next. My name is Diane Pleva. I'm the diagnostician at the University of Illinois Plant Clinic and my specialty is dead plants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least. And I'm Jim Appleby, a retired entomologist at the University of Illinois. So I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, Bob, we're going to start down with you. You brought a show and tell item. So let's discuss those strawberries. Okay. So what I want to start out with is we, I brought some strawberries. But one of the things that I always do when I'm on this program is I think everybody goes go to the grocery store every day as far as I'm concerned. I love grocery stores and and during this time of year there's all sorts of foods, uh, fruits and vegetables and things that are coming in from all over the world anymore and you ought to get, try them out and right now for some reason the straw the straw is strawberry season but they've got wonderful strawberries they come in from California wonderful strawberries and they're very inexpensive and it's, uh, it surprises me because we've heard about all the, the labor problems and we can't get migrant labor and everything I don't know how they even afford to pick the strawberries but they are there and they're really good. Now, when you go to the store anymore, it's much easier, the best way to pick the strawberries is you just <laughs> pick up a box. And, and so how do you tell what a good box of strawberries is? Well, what you do is pick them up and smell them. I'm taking, you know, and some of them will look real beautiful, but if they, they don't smell good, don't buy them. You want to get the ones that have nice, nice real strong fragrance and then you take in, and buy those and in, inside and the strawberries themselves. The way I eat strawberries, you got a, these delicious strawberries and eat the whole thing, cap it all. Whole thing, down the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> now, cap it all, is there a reason behind that? Is there more? Well, one, one of my friends over in Ohio State was doing a lot of work with a, with the medical group, and they found that there's an anti-cancer compound called the lagic acid that's found in the cap. Interesting. And the lagic acid help, helps reduce uh, throat cancers and actually has some effect on breast cancer. And so you really, you know, eat, eat a cap. You don't there have to eat go. them all, but you eat a cap and help protect you. Maybe you live longer. All right. So still give them a good sniff and eat the cap. <laughs> right. Those are your suggestions. <laughs> okay, great. All right, Diane, we're going to move with you. Now, her specialty, if you remember, is dead plants. Dead and dying. Dead, dead, and, dead dying. and dying. <laughs> dead and dying. So what have you got? So I brought a dead shrub. Um, this is a sumac, a uh, fragrant sumac. And the reason I brought the sample, and it actually was delivered to the plant clinic uh, a couple of uh, last week and you know obviously the top does not look so great and there are a number of things we can look for here we can look for bacterial pathogens fungal pathogens insect issues there's all sorts of things that we're going to want to look at but what shocked me was when we opened the package this is the plant that we got and in looking at this root system i assume that this came from a nursery because as you can tell it is maintaining that pot shape really nicely even out of the pot it turns out this was actually taken out of someone's yard this had been planted in ground for um, at least a year and so just by looking at how very well <laughs> rounded this root system is and you can see these large girdling roots and when you have roots like this that are starting to girdle and start this circling pattern um, this the shrub is never going to establish well into the into the landscape and at that point you know it almost doesn't matter what happens to the above ground part of the plant if the roots look this bad there this plant is never going to be healthy um, and so there may have been some other secondary issues that affected the top of this plant but really the, the cause of, of this failure was just this root system that never had a chance really. So a question. Yeah. As a curious yes. you know, gardener, <laughs> if you if, if the if the plant was still alive and in better shape, mm -hmm. would there be a chance that you could do some root pruning or could you save this? Yes. So if you get something like this, first of all, um, my, my grocery store tip is when you're buying plants, pop them out of the pot and take a look at the roots. And if they look like this, put them back in the pot, put them back and go find one that isn't quite so <laughs> circling. Um, but if you get this home and you look at it and you still want to give it a, you know, give it a shot, see if you can save it. Really what you want to do is either wash it really well and then try and kind of fluff the roots out. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do, um, and I actually read about this at a, at a, a certified arborist's um, or at a conference, just take a very sharp knife and cube it 
Ah. And so cut all four sides, cut the bottom as well, because what you're just trying to do is disrupt that circling um, mm -hmm. pattern. You're obviously going to damage the roots a little bit, but again, this plant had no chance, so sure. you might as well give it a chance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're and giving it a shot. the roots will come shooting out like yep. all over the place, and they'll, they'll go right in the native soil. And yep. Okay, so all is not lost, but you can't let it get to that point. But don't let it, don't plant it like that. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, wonderful. And Jim, you have some, some critters. <laughs> A well, critter. I, I, I did bring one quitter. Critter. <laughs> quitter. Quitter. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Um, we have not been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Just water. Uh, this this uh, insect here is called the uh, caterpillar of the uh, question mark caterpillar. And they feed on hackberries. You know, hackberry is a very common uh, tree throughout the Midwest. And it doesn't cause that much damage, but it's a very unusual caterpillar. It's got all these spines on it and perfectly safe to touch it. But it's vigorously feeding on this. Oh, yeah, he's been berry. munching since you brought him in. Then the other uh, insect that I brought on, on hackberry is called the hackberry blister gallus. These are these little spots on the undersides of the leaves that you see on, on, on hackberry. And... Uh, <coughs> The story behind this is that this insect emerges quite early in the spring. As soon as the hackberry leaves unfold, this insect, which is a little dark black insect, uh, will deposit its eggs on the unfolding leaves. And then uh, the eggs hatch, and then the insect feeds on the upper leaf surface, and then all of a sudden it sort of sinks down into the surface and forms these little blisters on the leaves. Then in the fall, generally it's sometime in uh, October or September, the um, insects emerge. They're a little tiny insect. Mm -hmm. They can actually go through window screens. So it's a sort of a pest in the home because they can get into the windows, go through the window screens. And so people see all these little black jumping insects in their homes. Uh, they like to overwinter in homes and <laughs> under tree bark outside, any sheltered spot. and. Uh, so that's a sort of a problem. They're just sort of a nuisance problem, but uh, they really don't affect that, the tree that badly. So I don't think they need to be controlled, but it's an interesting insect. I get a lot of calls from homeowners saying, you know, I got these little jumping insects in my house, and how do I prevent them? Are these the ones with that horrible, vicious bite that it's like a sharp pain? No, no, no. Okay, no. That, that's those the, are terrible. Yeah, <laughs> those, those, are, those are the ladybird beetles, or ladybugs, as they're called. It actually will feed, I mean, they will bite. No, no, these will not bite. Okay. It's, uh, it's simply, a, they're, they're so abundant in the fall that you know they're causing a problem. Gotcha. So they don't feed on your kids or dogs or cats <laughs> or anything. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. All right, Bob, we're gonna go back to you. We've got an email question, and it is a plant ID question, and it reads, it's Linda Lee and Beth, and they say, what is this plant? I received it along with some raspberry bushes, and now it's suffocating the raspberry bushes. Do we have a picture of that plant? And we're waiting mm. for it. All right, there's the photo. So okay. they wanna know what this is. Now, one of the things that you ought to know is if you're going to be planting raspberries and planting blackberries and planting ahead, that, that now's the time to take and put in your order. Start thinking about at least think about your variety. Put in the order when the plants come in. You take and plant them in the springtime. But you put if you want to go, have a good selection, you want to do it now. Now, what happened here is they ordered some raspberries, and you see the raspberries in the on the on the right side, the regular raspberries, and the raspberries have the little, little white flowers. Sometimes they're kind of pinky flowers. They go into raspberries, and then there's this other plant with these beautiful big rose-like flowers. It was re really beautiful. And I, I, I took that picture and expanded it where I could, I could look at it carefully. And it's also a blackberry. It, it's, a, it's a raspberry. And it's very vigorous. And what they said here, it, it, it got mixed in with the plants that they bought. It came in and it's, it's so vigorous, it's kind of overgrowing the raspberry plants. And they don't know if it's going to eat their children. Or, you know, <laughs> like the <laughs> insects over here, what's going on? But they're concerned about it. And so I, I, I looked it up and I, I have some experience with blackberries. And this is, it's another species called Rubus odoratus. Odor, you can smell like it. it. It doesn't smell bad. It's not that, but it's just called odoratus. And most uh, raspberries and blackberries are. They, they said they're biennial. The canes live live one year, and then they then you produce fruit, then they die back. This is one that's a perennial plant. It keeps on growing and flowering. It has these beautiful flowers. <laughs> they're knockout mm -hmm. flowers here, and some people actually use them for like a trellis because they're so so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a native plant 
and it's native from a, s somewhere up in Canada all the way along the East Coast is where it grow, grows naturally, and so it's kind of a lovely plant. And it does produce raspberries. And the raspberries, and I don't think I've ever eaten any of these. I've worked a lot of different species. I don't think I've eaten this one. But they say uh, normal raspberries kind of, they say thimble shaped, kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And these guys are flat. It's a raspberry. It's a, it's a flat raspberry. And you, you can eat them. They're fully, fully edible. There's nothing, nothing wrong with them at all. And so what I would do, so the question was, is, is it going to eat my garden? <laughs> and what I would do is just take them apart and put them over here someplace where you can enjoy the flowers. Just it kind of like thin them out it's, a it's, a, it's a perennial over here and put your raspberries over here. But the regular re little red raspberries or black, whatever kind you have. But it's, uh, it's an interesting mix up here that you got, you got a free plant. You, you won. <laughs> Jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to mix it up a little bit and go to the phones right now. Catherine is on the line from Charleston, and she has a question. Catherine, are you there? Hello, Catherine? Hello. Hello, hi, is this Catherine? Oh. <laughs> All right, let's try line two. Jim, with a question about a white peach tree. Jim, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, what's your question? Uh, i got a friend of mine that's got a uh, white peach tree. It's probably eight, maybe ten years old. But uh, every year, about a week before the fruit is ripe, they split open and um, clear slime comes out of the fruit, and then the fruit rots. He's got yellow peach trees that don't have any problem. Okay. What is it? I see some nodding going on here while you were talking. Guys, what do you think? I, I didn't Pardon get... Me? Okay. I was talking to the panelists. They were <clears throat> nodding as you were talking, so we're, let's see what they've got to say. I didn't quite catch when he opened up the fruit what was inside. He said there was a clear slime that ran out, and it was only affecting the white peaches. Okay. It sounds it like sounds, they, they got moses or they, yeah I, I was gonna say and i'm not i'm not an entomology specialist um but it sounds kind of like either a european uh fruit borer there are a couple of insects that will bore into developing yeah, fruit he said he didn't find anything inside just this gum well i don't know if he opened the fruit and looked or he, have you found anything in the fruit themselves Oh, we lost him. We're having a little trouble with the phones this evening. Jim, are you there? Yes. Okay. Have you found anything inside the fruit? No. Just mm. that that clear slime? Correct. Okay. I think it's that, that gum where it is. is it, there's some insect att att attacks them and causes this gummosis or something. This hor horrible stuff comes out. It comes out on the tree also. And I remember one of the things that I think uh, Roscoe used to say, you take a Q-tip and put some poison on it and put it actually in the hole where these, where these insects are and kill, kill the insects. So. But that's in the trunk of the tree. I don't yep. think it's in the fruit. Hmm. Any way for him to save the fruit or get around? Not that I know of. I... Yeah. It's kind of a tough one. Um, how about bringing something to the plant clinic? That's yeah, always... if, you have, if you have pictures, especially in spring when this occurs, um, if you want to take some pictures, you can send them to our, our website, or, or excuse me, our email address is plantclinic at illinois.edu. Um, you can also submit samples to the University of Illinois Plant Clinic. And um, I've noticed this on peaches before where I, I know, I think I know what you're saying. It almost looks like hot glue, like someone took a hot glue gun and just kind of left this big stringy white gooey mass on the surface of the, the fruit uh, itself. And there are a number of different insects that can, it, it's usually more just the wounding that occurs and then the gamosis is all of the um, kind of goo inside the developing fruit that kind of just squishes out like a horrible tube of toothpaste. <laughs> and uh, and so, so determining what the insect is would be really helpful because that's gonna be what allows us to determine control. Um, the other option is sometimes there are, there can be fungi that also cause gamosis, but that tends to be, uh, like Dr. Skirvin was saying, more on the trunk and less on the fruit themselves. Okay, so it sounds like he's gonna need a sample. I think so. Okay, all right. Let's go to line three. We've got Jean in Savoy has a question about a hib hibiscus insect. Jean, are you there? Yes, Hi. I am. Go ahead. Um, I have a plant that's totally skeletonized. That means no leaves, no blossoms, and it happens very quickly. 
I can't see any insect. Um, I've sprayed it with neem. When it started, there were like a little hole in the middle of the leaf, and I then I that didn't seem to be doing any good. So I sprayed I sprayed it with water, thinking it was aphids. But with all the rain, anytime I spray anything, it doesn't do a whole lot of good because it rains. <laughs> it, I did some research and I thought maybe it was a hibiscus sawfly, but I don't even know what they look like and I don't know what you do about it. And I don't know if this plant can be saved or not. I just never have seen the, uh, the hibiscus sawfly in the Midwest. Uh, did it say anything about where this sawfly occurs? Well, it said it like it likes specific types of uh, hibiscus, but I'm telling you, this thing, uh, it just devoured. <laughs> and where do you live? And what's part of the uh, Midwest? Uh, I live in Savoy. Savoy. Oh, Savoy, that's close. <laughs> yeah, I'm <clears throat> right here. Uh, are, are, so. are other plants skeletonized, or is it just, is just your the plant? Only, the only plant it liked was the hibiscus, then it started on a... Um, aster, but it only took half one side of the aster, and then I sprayed uh, seven on the aster because I thought maybe that would help. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I, I like I said, I just don't know of any uh, really insects that attack hibiscus uh, in the this Midwest. This is unbelievable. It, it it just devoured. You know, have you ever gone out at night with a flashlight and looked at the plant? Sometimes. Uh, uh, some insects feed at night, and you don't see them in the daytime. What, what insects would that be? Well, some of the cutworms will do that. They only feed at night. The what worms? Uh, cutworms. Cut They're a, a larva, a caterpillar-like thing. That. Where do they live during the day? Well, they're in the ground during the day. They hide. Hmm. So how do you treat it? Well, I think if it is that, seven would be a good uh, material to use. Yeah. But let's find out what it might be. and. Um, I get out there at night, sometime maybe like around 10:30, 11 o'clock at night after it gets dark. <laughs> give them time to get up there. Yeah, give them time, and then uh, see if there is something feeding at night. Because apparently you don't find anything feeding in the daytime. Is that true? Anything on the leaf? I I look underneath it. I look on top of it, yeah. and I can't see anything. I mean. Well, like I said, some some insects do feed at night. In fact, a good number of insects feed at night. That's a good suggestion. Okay, try checking the plan out at night. All right, Catherine on line one in Pawnee, and she also has a question about a white peach tree. Yes, I have a question about fertilizer, <laughs> and I'm wondering if there's such a thing as one size all um, fertilizer flowering plants. Oh, Catherine, we're having a lot of trouble hearing you. It's cutting in and out. Maybe try again. What was your question? I'm wondering if there is a one-size-fits-all for fertilizing a flowering plant. We got most of it. Is there a one-size-fits-all for... One more time. What? Are you there? Yes, we, we heard part of your question, but not all of it. You said, is there a one-size-fits-all? Well, uh, fertilizing. Uh, Fertilizer, garden. there we go, okay. Flowering, including, including hydrangeas and clematis. I'm wondering what the percentages of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash would be if there is a one-size-fits-all. So she's wanting to use like an all-purpose sort of thing. Do you have any recommendations for her for, for that? I'd say just regular old garden fertilizer, a 10-10-10 or 13 13, yeah. 13 and put it uh, kind of in the drip line of your peach tree this big and put, put that just around and probably not right now, but uh, <coughs> later on in the fall as the plants are going dormant. And, <coughs> and for sure in the springtime, it's a real good time to do that, taking fertilizer tree that then it stimulates growth. If you give it too much fertilizer too late in the season, what happens, it stimulates the tree to grow. And then when it gets cold, then you get a lot of frost damage. So probably, you, it's probably, probably kind of the end of the end of the time you can do it now, but wait until springtime and take it yeah. and put it all the drip line and put it in there. And okay. Yep. And just another quick um, recommendation for if you're looking at fertilizing kind of 
broad spectrum types of plants. Um, if you have plants that you're really concerned about, if you, if you have a lot of mulch or organic matter under those plants, if you can pull some of that back before you put the fertilizer down, that can sometimes help because um, sometimes fertilizer will end up bound to the organic matter, so bound to mulch, or if you've got leaves you know, that you're kind of using to, to mulch under plants. So um, if we have people, if you're fertilizing, you know, your entire yard, then just go for it, frankly. But if you've, <laughs> if you've got like specific plants that you know you really want to target, if you can pull back some of that mulch or if you can fertilize before mulching, then, then that can also help. Great suggestion. Okay, we're going to go to Venus. She's been waiting for a while in Decatur with a question about orchids and lilacs. Venus, are you there? Yes, ma'am. All right, what's Good your question? Evening. Uh, my, my orchids is so limpy, the leaves is not even, you know, kind of healthy and then the, the the soil is kind of very low and the roots is coming up so you've got wilt and you've got some exposed roots yes exposed roots and then the leaves are, are pretty limpy they don't have any life so orchids can be really difficult um Personally, I tend to view orchids as a very long-lived cut flower because I have a very hard time keeping them <laughs> alive. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that overwatering can cause a lot of rot issues. So it can cause root rots and stem rots. Um, and so if you have limp leaves, a lot of times people will want to water to try to, you know, they think, oh, it's, it's a little bit low on water. I should go ahead and, and give my plant a drink. Um, but that can actually sometimes encourage rotting issues. So what I would say, what sort of potting medium is your orchid in? Is it like in a bark or is it in soil? What What is your plant actually in? In a, a kind of a loose uh, a soil and a kind of a, a bark. Okay. It, it's not mine, it's my mother-in-law, but I don't know how to take care of it. <laughs> okay, okay, so the pressure is on, I understand. Um, so the good news is that what you described, the loose soil and the bark, that's that's really good for orchids, so that's, that's a good start. I would say, um, how often are you watering? Do we lose her? We planted, I mean, you know, change maybe change the soil or change the bark or whatever. Um, yeah, if you think that, especially if, if the bark is staying very wet or soggy, then potentially um, removing some of it. You don't want to remove too much because you don't want to disrupt the root system uh, too much. But I would just say be really careful with the watering. Make sure you're not overwatering it. Um, the roots poking out through the soil is actually not a problem. That's pretty normal for, for orchids. They're epiphytes. So they, they actually don't grow in soil in their native, uh, in their native areas. Um, so I would say just kind of maybe reduce watering. Keep an eye on it. But just... If, if, if this doesn't work out so well, you're not alone. I'm just letting you know that. Orchids can be really difficult to, to keep healthy. They are. I got yeah. two from I Mother's think Day. On, on water, one, one of my students was really good at orchids. And, and they, I think they said that you put an, put an ice cube. Yep. Yes. You put an ice cube with it. That's enough water yep. in every week For or something. For about a week, yeah. Yep. yeah. And that's all. It, it, it's, it's real easy. It doesn't yep. it, rot away. Yes, they are fickle. I, maybe I shouldn't call them fickle. Sensitive. There you go. <laughs> All right, Cindy on line five. Quickly, we've got about two minutes. Uh, she has a question about a corn borer. Yeah, I grew Indian corn for the first time this year, and I have an organic garden, and I had a real issue with corn borers. Um, they eat, they ate like about a third of the corn, and I was wondering if there's anything organic you can do to um, get rid of this pest. Huh, organic pest control. Uh, are you? Are they actually attacking the uh, kernels, or are they in the stalk? Uh, in the kernels. I think it's the probably the corn earworm rather than the corn borer. That's a different insect. So, uh, you know, I don't know of any. You, you know, you might try something like, but I'm not sure if it's approved. I'd have to find out or not whether it's approved on that. Uh, neem is one insecticide, but whether that has a label for corn, uh, I don't know. But you'd want to put it on uh, when the corn is about, I think it's about when it's starting to silk, because the insect then gets into the kernels. The corn borer is different. It gets into the stalk. So, but... I don't know. You'd have to look at the neem, N-E-E-M, label and see if that might be. And spinosad is another one that uh, is, a, is an organic. So spinosad 
as it's called, and you, and you go to any garden store and ask for spinosad. That's a bacterial insecticide. It's, it comes from a bacteria. And so those would be two that I, I, you look on. But again, I'm not sure, so sure with the label. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, and we've got about a minute left to go. Just to let you know our podcast is up. And Jim Appleby, actually, who is here right now, is our uh, podcast uh, person that was interviewed. So uh, what did you and Victoria talk about? We talked about pine wilt disease. Pine wilt disease. Okay. Yeah, very right. common disease throughout the entire Midwest. So. Okay, and you can find that on any uh, NPR, um, you can find that on our website, and you can find us on Instagram. There are several ways to get in touch with us, so definitely look for us there. And we had a lot of phone calls tonight. Didn't really get to a lot of our questions questions, but that's okay. We took a lot of calls. Um, thank you guys all so much for coming this evening. We really appreciate it, and thank you so much for calling, our wonderful experts and our viewers for sharing their time. Don't forget about all the fabulous ways you can find us on our socials, Instagram, Facebook, and our website and we will see you next week. Thanks for watching.